Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodney OBN. I'm the head of Special Collections and Archives at Keene State College in beautiful, uh, I should say, should, should I say rainy? It's not rainy anymore, right, Dan? No. <laughs> it's been uh, raining a lot. So, uh, uh, beautiful Keene, New Hampshire. I'll be your host tonight for the final installment of Archives in Context. Archives in Context is a series of online conversations about archives, preservation and culture in celebration of Archives Month observed annually in October. Our program is being sponsored by Keene State College's Mason Library, the New Hampshire State Archives and the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. I want to extend my special thanks to Dr. Celia Rabinowitz, Dean of Mason Library, the Honorable Brian Burford, the New Hampshire State Archivist, the Honorable Tanya Marshall, the Vermont, uh, the Vermont State Archivist, and Rachel Onuf, uh, Director of the Historical Records Program in Vermont. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our guests from our previous programs, uh, including Sarah Galligan, Library Director of the New Hampshire Historical Society, Paul Carnahan, Librarian of the Vermont Historical Society, John Levine, archivist of the Jazz, uh, Vermont Jazz Center, and Professor Jonathan Gittleson uh, at Key State College, from Key State College's art department. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank my colleagues Melinda Gill and Daniel Aho at Mason Library for helping me post the video recordings from our uh, Zoom sessions this month. Uh, now to our program. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce uh, you know, I said Dan White. Should I say Daniel White? You, you can okay? say Danny White. Danny Dan White. Okay. I'm okay. Rodney. You know me. I'm fine with it. Okay. Okay. Danny White has worked in film for over 20 years. Um, he has been an editor, producer, archival researcher, cinematographer, and film restorationist. He's currently post production supervisor for Ken Burns's Florentine Films. With his team, uh, Dan has restored the Civil War series, Brooklyn Bridge, the Shakers, and the baseball series, as well as maintaining Burns' vast catalog of film. Dan lives in Keene, New Hampshire with his wife and two children. And it's also worth noting that Dan is a member of the Keene State College class of 1995. Did I get that right? Okay, good. Barely. Uh, Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Um, we will be taking questions uh, and later in the program. So please post your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them in the order that they were received. Uh, also, this program is being recorded and will be made available on Mason Library's Facebook page. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Danny White, Dan White, Daniel White, whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever. Godzilla White, whatever you want. <laughs> Hi, Dan. How you doing? Hey, Rodney. I'm doing good. Good to see you so, again, even though we just saw each other you. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. So um, <laughs> I, I can turn it over to you. I, I know everyone's dying to know what's in Florentine Films archives. I'm sure you're going to tell us, but you're going to tell us more. I, I, sure. So... Um, <clears throat> I guess, um, yeah, I can start with uh, a little bit of the filmmaking process and then go into the archive. Uh, so early on, as, as everyone probably knows, you know, Ken started out with Brooklyn Bridge and that was only about an hour long and he was nominated for an Oscar. Um, so that's one hour of film that you see but with any film, that's, that's the tip of the iceberg of what actually happens. And if anyone has actually heard, you know, ha has heard Ken talk before, he comes up with a very New Hampshire um, saying uh, and relates it to film as, as only he can do. Um, that is, uh, filmmaking is like making maple syrup that takes 40 gallons of sap to get one gallon of syrup. So, that ratio actually is off. <laughs> it might have been that Brooklyn <laughs> Bridge. But when we shoot, when we do a film, that interview that you see, and you might see maybe, you know, throughout a film, uh, for example, Country Music, which was, I think, about 
16 hours or so, uh, you might see an interview and that might be about 10, in, 10 minutes, maybe 15, if they're lucky, 20 minutes of that interviewee speaking in the film, sometimes only three minutes. Those interviews themselves take two hours, hour, hour and a half to two hours. So think of all the materials that you don't get to see. And none of that is bad. Not, nothing, and Ken said this, nothing that goes on the edit room floor is bad. It just couldn't make it into the film, mm. you know? So you have to do that editing. So what do we do with all of that? You know, it's like all this beautiful unseen footage, all of these interviews that were done early on um, with David McCullough and other his, so many other historians, Shelby Foote from uh, the Civil War. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I restored the Civil War, one of my priorities was to find every piece of footage and audio from his interviews and put it all back together so wow. that, oh yeah, so that people can see it. I want, because personally, I wanted to see the entire interview. I wanted to see the, and hear Ken's questions and hear you know, all the outtakes uh, from Shelby Foote uh, because Shelby Foote takes up a good amount of Civil War, uh, you know, the film, but boy, there are <laughs> hours of Shelby Foote just talking and saying these wonderful things. And then you hear Ken in the background um, and he might just, and this is, this is very telling of the interviewer, uh, of the, uh, the, you know, Ken as an interviewer, that Ken will just, you'll hear Antietam. And then Shelby Foote would just start talking and would talk for 20 minutes about Antietam. Ken wouldn't lead, wouldn't push him into these certain ways. You don't hear the questions in the actual film. So one of our goals at Florentine Films, and I hope, is to reconstitute as many interviews as we can from all of the past films all ready for country music and for Vietnam, since those were mostly shot digitally, we were able to share those. And for country music, there was over a hundred interviews. And I think at least 20 of those folks have since passed uh, from those interviews. Uh, and we, uh, uh, Florentine Films uh, can donated those interviews, um, oh geez, to the Country Music Hall of Fame, I believe. Oh, wow, great. Yeah, so academics can actually go into these places, sit down and start listening and, and watching these interviews. And when I restored the Civil War, uh, I was able to reconstitute eight interviews and uh, American Archive for Public Broadcasting actually is hosting them on their website. So if you go to um, American Archive for Public Broadcasting, type in Civil War, you can see uh, Shelby Foote, I think Shelby's on there, and uh, seven other interviews in their entirety, Un unedited. And it's just fascinating to hear, you know, so much more of, of what they've said. Uh, so that's a little bit about it uh, uh, in the filmmaking. And Rodney, anytime that you have a follow-up or if you have a question, you know, pop in and I'll... I, I think, I think you, you, I mean, you, you're... <laughs> we watch these movies and, you know, uh, and you see these interviews and, but and as an archivist, you know, I have, I have a lot of these interviews too, but we, you only see a fraction of it. And wow. I just, I can't only imagine. Well, you can show it to me someday. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I know. And the amazing. more I find, you know, sometimes uh, it's so sad because, uh, um, and a, a lot of folks probably listening, you know, you, uh, Preservation uh, and archiving were not much of a thing, you know, until, you know, 20, 30 years ago. You hear these horror stories of like, oh, all the Johnny Carson shows between these years. Actually, they, they were one off. So they just put them on a barge and pushed them into the harbor, you know, of New York because and or they recorded over all these things. Nobody thought of saving these things because it wasn't a part of the thought process then of like, oh, this might be interesting down the road for historians or others to enjoy. It's like, here's a tape, yeah, record over it. Oh, <laughs> that was a never before seen interview with somebody. 
So, you know, folks like Martin Scorsese and others out there, they really promoted this and, and thankfully brought a lot of archivists out of the, the basement, honestly, you know, where a lot of folks would just spend their time caring for these materials, you know, that they had been sitting on because there's, there are people who have always known, no, this is important. This is important. Let's hold on to this. Let's preserve this. Let's keep it in the right humidity, uh, fire resistant. Let's try to save this for the generations down the road who won't have an idea of what is happening now, all the news stories, things like that. Um, you know, so uh, it really, um, sadly, it's almost become a trend. You know, I can't say sadly, but it's like, we wish that it had been going on, you know, since the beginning of film. It is, you know, like all writings, you know, you hear about Dead Sea Scrolls and, you know, things being dug up and we're like, oh my gosh, that tells us so much. These 10 words on, you know, a piece of parchment or whatever it might be, tell us so much about that time period. And, and I feel like, you know, all of these interviews uh, and all of, all of the other materials and honestly, even negatives that you have in your closet or you know old films you know of your family whatever it might be you know never throw away your negatives <laughs> I really <laughs> want to keep saying that never throw your negatives away you know because your your photograph your print is not that's not you know gonna last as long as that piece of acetate or negative yeah. so hold on to them please um, and I come from a photography background and worked in uh uh, labs, you know, uh, dark rooms, things like that. So that is where I kind of got a little bit of the archival bug. Yeah, uh, I was I was going to ask you that how you how you um, sort of became interested in archiving personally. So that through, through photography, then. So yeah, uh, and uh, oddly enough, I, I grew up in uh, mostly in Fitzwilliam, and uh -huh. in in 1991 when Civil War came out. I just happened to watch it turning 18 uh, at the time. Um, and also in 1991, there was a war that was starting 18, you know, and watched the, the civil war and learned what war really was about. And also at that time, the photography in the civil war series really like changed my ideas of kind of what I really wanted to do and I was like I want to photograph like that um you know not 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 as much Ken's films but the images that he used in the film so actually weirdly um Civil War helped shape my <laughs> direction <laughs> so, so um you have some things you want to show us, uh, or sure. I, I don't. I, 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 I can ask you tons of questions, but I, I, yeah. Do you really, any questions from folks? I'll uh, take no, honestly no. anything. I'm I'm totally happy. <laughs> and I'll talk have about any, whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't think we have any questions just yet. Okay. Uh, but uh, go go ahead and um, sure. show us some of the things that you were you, you were. Yeah, um, so the, yeah. the last restoration I did, and um, I call it the um, restoration, but it's also preservation. It's uh, um, some people call it remastering, but uh, I mm -hmm. think it, when it comes to the depth of what we do for Ken's early films to bring them out uh, uh, is a full restoration. Like um, when the film is first made, it uh, is all cut together. You know, they make a duplicate of the negative mm -hmm. and they, that is that they make it into a positive where the editors can start editing, splicing film together. So they splice it all together. So they have these long rolls. You can see all the pieces of tape sort of in that roll. Um, and then from once they are finished, they lock the cut then they send that off and a negative cutter who's still around, Noelle Penrat, who helps us out still, um, she reconstitutes all the original camera negatives. That's the negative that came out of the camera. She puts that all back together to match that just editing version. 
then that is transferred and titles are added, things like that. So it drops in quality. It, tra it transfers to a second um, version. And I won't get into A and B. There's like more complicated things. I'm sure a couple of you people know about A and B. But anyway, um, so from the original, the quality drops a couple times. So what I do is go back and find all of the original camera negative. That's wow. the A, B rolls, the original camera negative, wow. um, how it's all cut together. And then anywhere there was a title that was swapped out with like lower quality versions. So I go back and try to find those original negative of where those titles were so that the quality looks its best. And then working with George Eastman House, they scan in 4K, 16 millimeter film. And I'll say 16 millimeter is about that big, the size of my pinky, uh, my fingernail. So you can barely see the image on it, but when wow. it's scanned in 4K, it looks pretty darn terrific. Yeah. So I get all those scans, cut it back together based on the broadcast master, trying to figure out all the dissolves, but I know they're usually 12 or 24 or some division of tw 24. Um, so this is baseball and you'll be able to see, hold one second. I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. The fundamental reason for the popularity of the game is the fact that it is a national safety valve. So I'm going to scoot through this here and there. Take a moment. Seems so obvious. The one oh delivery to Fitz. Maybe we overlook it. Long drive left field. If it stays there, it's gone. Home it's run. more beautiful. The Red Sox win. And the series is tied. Three games apiece. Now, if any of you have seen baseball before, and of course, you're seeing it in. <laughs> you know, like on your iPad or whatever right now, you're not seeing it on a beautiful 4K screen at home. So I guess you just have to trust me, it looks better. But uh, it looks we, good. Scan, <laughs> we scan the original Believe camera me. negative and we're, what we're able to do is bring it back to how Ken saw it through, the, through his camera lens, really. To, and another reason we wanna restore these things, we wanna keep them all, keep the integrity, exactly how they were cut. We, we're not going to change anything, not going to change a cut on you, take, take out a scene or add a scene that Ken's always wanted. Um, we, we know that younger people today have a much higher expectation of quality than, than we did when we were watching, you know, square TVs back in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. You know, even on their phone, they're seeing, you know, 2K, you know, resolution. They're seeing mm -hmm. the fine detail. Um, so any of their phones is, you know, two to three times the resolution of any of our TVs from before 2000. And so it makes it, younger people, it's hard for them to even, I can't even do it anymore. I can't watch a VHS, it's so bad. Um, but, you know, they want to see something that looks good. And we want to reintroduce these films to them. Uh, cause I talked to a, a friend at work who was 29 at the time. And I was like, have you seen Civil War? And he was like, yeah, I tried. I just, it was like doing this and like, it just looked mm -hmm. bad. And that was before I restored it. And I was like, yeah, I get it. You know, so we want it for them, for the, for the younger audiences, not just baseball, but Civil War you know, and all of Ken's past catalogs. And we're trying to plug away as we get funders, we work our way through each film. And um, Lewis and Clark is the next one I really want to do because that's going to be gorgeous. It is a gorgeous film to begin with. Um, the one thing I will say about the baseball restoration is you might remember, 
uh, and you might give me flack in the questions, but uh, you <laughs> might I be- won't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that it used to be 4-3, and then we changed the aspect ratio to 16-9, which means we did push in. Um, but thankfully, um, if I can find one, Oh yeah, so you know who's who's this kid? First thing I got. <laughs> um, if I can find him, so you can see that we pushed in, but the quality is so much better. But not only that, um, you can see here. One moment, please. You can see here that um, there's more to the image than was originally seen. I had uh, Eastman scan out to the sprockets. And when possible, I would use what was shot in the sprockets to be able to lessen the impact of the, the zoom in. So if you look at that interviewee, so if you look at the edge of the painting, it was closer cropped in to the edge of that painting and all that image area on the right side wasn't there before, but I was able to introduce it into the new version of baseball. I didn't always, always have all that room over there, but um, I tried to squeeze in as much as possible and lose as little as possible. So again, I didn't want to change any of the integrity of the film. On the other films, uh, we we kept it 4-3. We wanted to keep all of the image area. Baseball, you know, it was not as significant and uh, the the funders kind of wanted it, <laughs> even a new format for, for new viewers to, to watch again. Um, I, hey, Mike Riley, I see you just uh, asked the question. Um, <laughs> oh, geez. Um, what, uh, I would, uh, so Mike Riley, uh, is asking who the photographer is, um, uh, that inspired me and, uh, his name was, um, oh geez, uh, is it, oh geez, I can't remember his name. Uh, in fact, I'm going to just look it up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Matthew Brady. There was another one that, uh really um, was a great influence. Um, Mike, I'm gonna have to chat with you offline about uh, the photographer that inspired me the most. Um, uh, because what I like is like the day-to-day, -day, the mundane, you know, things that just were happening, not, you know, some significant event. It's like those little details that would be happening, you know, off to the side some of my favorite things are crowd reaction, you know, of like onlookers, because that tells such a different story than what's actually happening. And, um, you know, when you're working in film, it's like those reaction shots are terrific. Um, so yeah, that's a, a little bit of the restoration and oh, I see another question. Eugene yeah, Smith, no, it wasn't Eugene, Mike. Oh, I can't remember, uh, Curtis. Curtis was his name. Um, oh, Edward okay. Curtis, I think. Uh, but yeah, Edward Curtis. He's one of my favorite photographers. He did a lot of uh, um, indigenous uh, photography, you know, back in, oh, geez, I forget which years, but yeah, very early on. Um, what else? Do we, do we have any other but things? Sarah, Rodney, yeah, um, sure. I'm, I was wondering, sir, as you're working through the archive, through the catalog, what have what have been what has been some of your biggest surprises? And and as you're trying to, I guess you're trying to organize things. What what yeah. have been what has been some of your biggest challenges? So biggest surprises, biggest challenges. Um, yeah. You know. Oh my um, God, or oh, oh, something else. So uh, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, uh, one of the, oh gosh, it like makes my stomach turn every time I think about it. Um, when I was restoring the shakers, um, you know, when you, when you see everything, when it's first scanned, it's mm -hmm. in log. 
So it's so it's kind of a flat looking, you know, look sort of like this interview that's up right now. Um, and then once you apply color, you know, you uh, like when you bring your images or negatives to a um, to a color lab type, you know, to be processed. They change the color, they increase the contrast, they bring out the skin tones, make it look beautiful. So the first day when we were starting to do the color on the shakers, I started seeing this blue flutter all over the image, all throughout. And I was like, something's weird. Can you, you know, is there something going on with the computer or whatever? And we kept checking different spots and, uh, oh my gosh, it was, <laughs> it was hard. Um, because this is like, you know, what Ken's second film, I think, um, the, one of his earliest. And so that original camera negative, before it went to Eastman, it was sitting who knows where in some basement, you know, in New York or wherever it might've been or under a stack of other film. And over the 25, 30 years, um the emotion started degrading or we're not exactly sure what um but it caused this blue flutter all the way through essentially his original negative of his film was not ruined but close to ruined due to age or whatever it might have been just poor handling poor ex maybe exposure to to damp or something i don't know We'll never know, but uh, having to tell, you know, your boss to tell Ken, like, oh gosh. And it took me, <laughs> it took me a, a couple hours just to like breathe through and like call him and say, Ken, the film is, is not, it's, it's essentially kind of ruined. We still have image, but it, it was uh, really damaged. And, uh, you know, we have old tapes of it and other film copies, but they're not great. We wanted the original camera negative to make it look its best. So his original was severely damaged and uh, he couldn't even talk. He, you know, he was like pretty sad about it, obviously. And um, that like killed me, you know. And luckily it was at a time where digital restoration was able to take out a lot of it, you know? So if you see it now, it's, it's there, but it's hard to notice, you know? It was able to sort of select and see, you know, that fluttering. Um, sometimes it had an, a weird effect, you know, on the image, but we were able to save most of it. So that's one of the surprising things. And also starting to hear, so I'll say, you know, film, film, uh, 16 millimeter negative color film if it, it's treated right can last 100 years or more mm -hmm. black and white can last hundreds of years if well maintained and taken care of anything magnetic eh, 10 20 30 <laughs> years so any of that old magnetic tape and all of these interviews back then were you know they were shot on film and off to the side was a guy with you know headphones and a boom mic recording everything on what's called a Nagra, which was a reel-to-reel -reel audio tape. And a lot of that early audio, the interview interviews are being lost, slowly lost, uh, just it's called shedding, where the, the, uh, the, you know, you have the tape and parts of it is like falling off, you know, cause it's like kind of iron magnetic filings. that's kind of mm -hmm. glued on to plastic. And over time, you know, it degrades. And uh, just like, you know, you have VHS at home. Let's say that you, you know, filmed your family back in 82. Take a look now and see what it looks like. Not great. You'll see all this, you know, distortion. And uh, that's, that's your film, you, you know, your family fading away if you don't get it transferred soon enough. So that's that's one major thing that like, uh, it's a killer because it's like, you know, and it's not just about his feeling. It's like I have the feeling like these things are being lost for everyone. You know, it's and I think he thinks the same thing. It's like this is it's not his exactly anymore. It's 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 the world's. It's everybody's. 
Um, and that's why we do everything on PBS. So it's like, that belongs to everyone now. Um, you know, so trying to be a steward of, you know, those materials. And it's like all the other materials out there that, you know, we all worry about. And uh, like Frederick Weissman, you know, some of his materials are, are down at uh, Library of Congress. And I saw like a can of Titicut Follies um, sitting on a shelf. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, you know, one of my favorite films. And it's like, but there are probably other cans, you know, sitting in someone's garage that might have been, might be some original camera negative of his or other filmmakers, you know, that is like slowly degrading that once it's gone and once the people's memories of watching it is gone mm -hmm. and that's it. So, yeah. I, well, I, I, and so just to follow up on that, as you're, as Ken's making new films, as you and Ken are making new films, has, have you been thinking uh, more about sort of including the archiving aspect or preservation aspect in the workflow? And so, if so, um, what, what, are, what are you doing? Um, so, yeah, um, when we started talking about all of this, um, we decided to start putting that into a line item and uh mm. you know because we never you know like just put it in the garage put it in the bank you know in in the whatever you know it's like we're done with the film you know that's what the that's what everybody thought way back when i'm sure there was some you know um that were like we need to preserve this but most filmmakers were like we did the film here it is anything outside of that what do we need that for this is the film um, but yeah, we decided to put uh, uh, into the um, light line, line items of the budgets and archiving and preservation line so that at the end of the film, okay. all of the materials are preserved, treated in a way, put, most of what we do now is uh, digital, thankfully, um, in some ways, because we can save it to what are called LTO tapes, and they have a good lifespan, 30 to 50 years um and we can make one version here one version there we can send a couple versions somewhere and uh it's essentially almost in the ether and plus we have local backups mm -hmm. so we're in a much better place did with digital to be able to do that preservation uh with film you know usually people would make film copies but that's somewhat unwieldy because it's like that's very costly for one and you would want to do it the best way possible and you know what put it in three color black and white stock film yeah that'll last a few hundred years but if you scan it at the highest resolution you can put it on lto tapes or you know in a few different places then it's like that can be copied over and over and over and over again with no degradation if it's done right because it is you know zeros and ones it is bits it's a description of uh, the original so yeah we've been thinking about it yeah, <laughs> especially well, after um, you know some of the losses yeah what yeah I, so things like research notes and now in, in ken's films there's an incredible amount of archival research you know i mean it's yeah. not only images but so um, what, what about those sorts of things, um, sort of the, 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 you know, the, the research ask, the research files and so forth, are, are they yeah. digitized or, 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 do you, or do you save the, with as much older films, um, save, mm -hmm. save the research notes or, or, or whatnot to, um, and do they go to Eastman House or do you, uh, or, um, do you have a other place that you store them? Um, um, uh, yeah. Your basement? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my vault. No, no, no. Your um, vault, I, yes. Um, when it comes to a lot of the paperwork, you know, um, uh -huh. I mean, that, that gets to be a lot of stuff. And we've been trying to decrease the amount of paper that we use. Um, so, yeah, if, if there are digital files, they are saved. Um, and we're still working on this. Nobody has the method. There's not, hey, the method. This is what we're doing. You know, even when it comes to phrase terms and everything, you know, there's PB core and, uh, you know, different mm -hmm. ways to catalog all of this. So it's like you wait to see which one floats to the top. 
and try to move all that data around. But anyways, um, so when our researchers, you know, are doing this research, um, and I, I did archival uh, research uh, for Roosevelt and uh, help out on other films, but uh, I, I did archival footage. So now what we get are digital files and those are backed up, but of course uh, some archives ask that we destroy the originals after we put that, put what we're using in the film. So we, we have to do that. Otherwise anything oh. from national archives, library of Congress that is not copywritten, we save, we save it. Um, you know, we get a good scan, we're gonna save it. We might use it again, first of all, mm -hmm. if it's from the national archives, it's usually public domain. So we can reuse that. And we might be using this much of a clip that's that much, you know, uh, like 10 seconds from, you know, a 15 minute film. So we might be using that again. So we have what's called an HD footage library. So we have a, a, a server that has like our own internal library. It's like, oh, go to that scene, you know, that, that shot from uh, the National Archives or from Library of Congress and pull that again. And in fact, for baseball and for Brooklyn Bridge, Ken uses an early shot um, from, where is it? From the, oh yeah, here it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he uses this. Let's see if we can, I don't think we can see it, so. Oh, I see it on mine. Um, can you see it, Rodney? I can't see it. We'll wait until we can see it. Maybe it can it work the last time? Yeah, I, I see it on my end. Anybody? Uh, can anyone say? It. I'll just trust that people can see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got because a bad eyesight, showing... so I can't see anything to begin with. But I don't. I don't see. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's a. It's a. Um, it's a shot. Uh, taken from the front of a trolley going over the Brooklyn Bridge. And it was originally used in, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, film that he did originally. Um, and he also used it in baseball. We've used it in other films. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can replace it in baseball with the one that I had scanned for, for the Brooklyn Bridge. And actually I called the Library of, Art, uh, of Congress and they rescanned it at an even higher quality wow. for me. And so I was able to replace oh, it, in both, it yeah. in both versions. A man named Charles Hercules Ebbets began seeking. So essentially I got a 4K scan of something taken in you know the late 1800s Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was from wow. uh, the paper print collection. Uh, I can't even go into that because that's a whole other, that's a whole other story, which I love. <laughs> um, do, do folks have questions? Like, uh, yeah, sure if, if, if folks it. have questions, oh, yeah. um, post them in the Q and A. Um, and and that's people uh, are thinking for about folks who don't know the Q and A. That's the lower right hand side. Um, like you'll see, raise hand okay. Q and A. There there's somebody, Juliana. Oh, okay. Hi, Juliana. Juliana. Hi, she's in DC someplace. How you doing? Uh, she asks, uh, Juliana asks, what advice do you have for those who want to go into film archiving? Yeah, go into hedge funds, then you could afford to go into <laughs> film archiving. I was going to say <laughs> cryptocurrency, but that's a different conversation. So, um, no, no, there, there's, there's some good programs. Maybe you know yeah. a couple good programs. So I mean, go ahead. Up at Eastman, uh, is it the Selznick at Eastman? The Selznick, yeah. Um, they have a graduate program at um, at uh, at the Eastman House Selznick uh, School of Film Preservation. They yeah. offer um, a certificate, a graduate certificate or MA. And uh, I was just talking to someone today, a colleague, who mentioned the films from Florentine Films that they have mm -hmm. there. And so, uh, so actually, if you were um, uh, going through that program, uh, you can probably work on Ken Burns's material yeah. there too. Or, there's, or Martin there's, Scorsese's, uh, Martin Scorsese's yeah. there and Ron Howard's materials there. Stanley Kubrick has some materials over there too. Um, there's, and if there. you look, you know, just, to, um, I mean, there are those courses, but really to like go into film archiving, you know, if you're not going to a college um, to do it, Honestly, 
you know, I didn't go to college for archiving. It just became a bug, you know, that uh, I, I went to Keene State um, that I really got interested in. And I got to say about anything for filmmaking, for archiving, a great way is apprenticing, interning, you know, find a place to intern at and see if you like it, first of all, because um, you're going to spend a lot of time in a place that smells like old paper, you know, <laughs> and, and vinegar often. Um, and that's a lot of archives that I've been in. And I mean, I love it. And I, I anytime I walk in, I'm like, ah, uh, you know, it's like, it's fun. Um, and honestly, like finding some of this stuff is so cool. You know, the little gems and I call them, um, uh, we always say, oh, there's a, there's a gem or I got an Easter egg hunt for you when we're looking for an archival piece of footage or an archival photograph. You know, that is so fascinating because it's not just the preservation, you know, there, that's an aspect, but there's the, you know, the research, the finding, the investigation, you know, yeah. it, it really is like a hunt. It's, it's, it's like the wow moment. You know? it's yeah. Like, oh my you, gosh. You find it, you, it's kind of this jolt of adrenaline that you found something that you only dreamed of finding or. Oh know, yeah. And yeah. So I'm, I'm sure you've had a lot of moments like that. And those moments have appeared in, Ken's film for sure, um, but uh, Juliana, as uh, you know, as Dan said, yeah, I think you're doing that now. Our, our interning, and there's there's a lot of programs there, and um, so definitely, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess a lot of people, particularly with film preservation and archiving, um, you know, they they have they apprentice or they intern, and that's how they learn uh, most of you know most of what they know. And, yeah, of course, you can go to a program, too. Um, but uh, I like the apprentice system, you know, quite honestly. That's, it's terrific. That's a good way and to I learn. started that's as an intern at Florentine. And, I, and okay, most of us who work at Florentine started as interns. I think there was like only three or four people, <laughs> uh, not including Ken, you know, who didn't start as interns and learned the way, you know, intern to apprentice and then moving on. Uh, from there so hopefully juliana uh hopefully that answered yours and i see eric, mm -hmm. um, eric yeah eric has to go ahead if you want to read his question sure. dan um so eric says is restoring a different medium such as uh is restoring a different medium such as animation or stop motion a similar process i would say it's very it's the same because you think of frame by frame by frame and you know film you know, most film before now is 24 frames per second. Um, but when you get to pre-1930, you know, uh, like home movies, a lot of it's 18 frames per second. But if you see stop motion, it's shot frame by frame by frame. And you're trying to restore every single frame. And a lot of that, thankfully, uh, I mean, and it's really before like four or five years ago, like the digital um, restoration software was not very good. It would like remove pieces, you know, people's face. <laughs> like it would remove way too much when all you want to do is remove dust that gets on the, on the negative, really. You know, if you look at any old photograph, there's probably a dust spot somewhere on there. Or you watch an older film, you see like, a snowstorm of dust often. So we use a software that looks at every frame and it's like, oh, there's a piece of dust and it can tell because, and I call them Sharpies because there's like a little bright white star right there that's super sharp. And it, the software will look at the frame before and the frame after. And they're like, I didn't see that there. There's something wrong there. And it would take often either surrounding around that little spot, it, almost like you do in Photoshop, you can take one little piece, you know, few pixels from here, put them over here. But often what the software will do, and you can do it manually also, is like, look at the frame before, look at the frame after. Hey, you know what, that's, it looks better there. Let's just take those frame, you know, that those little few pixels from the frame before or after and replace that little dust spot. 
you know, so you can't even tell now often. And then what the, the, um, the software can't get rid of, that's where people come in. And it's funny that you say um, stop motion because uh, one of the folks, his name was Morgan, who did a lot of the help uh, in restoration on our Morgan Miller. Um, he was a stop motion animator where he would, you know, he was drawing frame by frame and would make stop motion animation. So that probably helped in his process of being able to go through frame by frame and clean dust and scratches uh, from, from our films. So uh, Eric, hopefully that, uh, that helps. Um, and uh, I, Serena um, Monroe, uh, 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 Serena says, hello, my name is Serena. I'm really interested in Florentine films. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you're accepting interns at this moment with COVID still in sight. We really wish we were. <laughs> um, and uh, like before Delta, we were like, yes, let's, I can't wait. We're going to start it back up, you know, and uh, then Delta came back around. We, we're not even really open. You know, I'm working out of my basement right now. <laughs> Most of us are working out of, if you can't tell. You know, <laughs> um, there's my freezer back there. Um, <laughs> What's that, in your uh, freezer? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> nothing. Um, nothing. So, um, uh, while, since we've been closed, like we, uh, Ken had somebody like re sand the floors and clean the place, paint it, you know. So, we were hoping to have been moved back in by now, but we have not been able to. Um, few of us are going in and out now. Um, and it's like every couple months I'm like, Oh, I think because I, I was running the internship program and um, I'm working with a couple other folks uh, at Florentine um, and we have so many backed up resumes and I feel awful. And I feel, I think for any industry right now, it's like, we're, we're letting a lot of people down and we're losing a lot of help because there's these past year and a half where a lot of people have been in college and leaving college who have not had the opportunity to be able to internship. And it's like, they just lost a year and a half of that. And now because there's gonna be a backlog of people who do want this, that more people will lose the opportunity. And I don't know what we can all do to be able to make up for that. And I don't know, you know, I've been thinking about whether to do you know, more like classes, you know, sort of like this kind of thing to be able I to. I think like this would be good. Yeah. I think yeah, doing something you know, like this would be helpful too. And maybe talking to people about what you're doing or, you know. Uh, yeah. It's not I as think, much hands-on that they were able to get at yeah. Florentine, you know, because most, most of the interns that uh, come to Florentine, you know, often are able to, to move on to like mm -hmm. really fascinating, you know, cool things out there. Um, so yeah, we're, we feel terrible about not, I mean, we are accepting applications, uh, but we're just, we're not able to, to take any, uh, anyone on right now. We, we did a couple, we tried to do remote in our New York office and it worked okay, but it just is not, the, it's not the same, um, as the more hands-on. So hopefully soon. And uh, we usually take on two to three at a time every three months. And it used to be a lot longer with, you know, more people. But uh, we've been trying to get more people through the process uh, to be able to experience it. And I, I, I feel like any film company or any business really, you know, should take a, and we pay our interns, of course, you know, should, should do this. Because, you know, I grew up through the internship and apprentice and it's like invaluable. So you can't can't get anything better unless you pay a hundred thousand dollars to NYU or whatever it is. Yeah. No offense, anybody else from NYU? No. In there. <laughs> um, I have a I have a I have a question. So I haven't done a lot of archive. You doing it? I haven't done a lot of archival research. Um, do you have any favorite places, archives, repositories that stand out? You know. Um, in, in all your trips, because I know you've worked on so many films. Every time I see you at Blue Bakers, you'll say, I'm working on this. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just make me feel, make me feel so bored with my life, mm -hmm. you know. Um, any, any 
archives, repositories, or someone's basement or that's the attic, thing. or I, I mean, because you it's, know, you know, yeah, going to like Library of Congress and National Archives, awesome, but the coolest is like going to a photographer's home. You know, I, I find that the most fascinating, you know, and, and, and I'll, in particular, we, um, for uh, country music, I got to visit some photographers that just blew me away and it like inspired me. And, um, and also I, I think some of the best moments are like uh, um, when you get to go to what someone's actual, home, like um, Patsy Klein's family, um, Ooh, yeah, so they they had a, a little house, and uh, um, one of the other producers and I were able to go there and look through family albums as they were packing up the home. They were packing up the home, you know, because they were about to sell, you know, an elderly relative's you know place, and it it was Patsy's old house, and uh, they pulled out these albums, and we we're like, oh my goodness, you know, it was just like. <laughs> looking into their life, you know, and her life. And uh, like I said about those, those mundane, you know, moments are just like fascinating of like, mm. oh yeah, there's Patsy Klein with the family blowing out candles, you know, at the kitchen table, you know, things like that. That's where it's like just, you know, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. We went to Johnny Cash's, uh, um, family's house and uh, got to go through that archive and you're like oh my gosh. and it turns out Johnny Cash I had no idea was a, a photographer himself sort of a hobbyist and he did a lot of macro stuff and like just looking through you know his photographs it was so fun so yeah all the big archives are so fascinating but it's really you know those personal moments in people's you know, personal collections where they're like, oh, you don't want to see that. It's just, you know, it's just us, blah, blah, you know, doing family stuff. And it's like, no, this is like, this is intimate. And thank you for letting us in. You know, that's, <laughs> that's not like, that's the connection, you know, um, that, that, that I think we're going for and not, not being gratuitous, gratuitous. It's like, this is for real. So. Yeah, looking for that intimate moment or, I mean, that's sort of, um, yeah, I mean, people's like, well, you know, why do you have some of these mundane things? Well, those are the moments that are kind of fleeting. And so you, you know, it's, and it's, it's kind of magical to run into those sorts of things. So a letter, you know, kind of, Gosh, a, yeah. you know, a little, you know, kind of a funny snapshot or something like that. And, um, does anyone have any more questions? Uh, we're running up against the hour, and uh, uh, we're going to be talking about Godzilla. No, we're not going to be talking about Godzilla. <laughs> <That's okay. Sorry. laughs> we were talking about Godzilla before we got we got on the uh, got on the air there. Um, but any does anyone have any other questions? Um, yeah, I'll well, take it. Not, don't be shy. Don't take it. Yeah, he's 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 a brave soul. Um, well, then I, I think, um, do you have anything, any other questions, Rodney? Um, I don't get out much, Rodney, if you can't tell. I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that someone, someone gave me some really good recommendations for, for, for something. So, um, oh, I, okay. <laughs> just, so, but I, I, uh. Yeah, it's, it's 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 such a pleasure to have you. I know you live in Keene and just your passion for archives, for film preservation. Um, That's why we know, get so, along. You know, yeah, and just having a kindred soul um, nearby. And so um, thank you so much for sharing your enthusiasm. And I, I'm looking forward to we're doing more of these sort of programs with you. Maybe we can do it uh, together, you know, in, 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 you know, in real life instead of on Zoom, but um, let's, yeah. So uh, keep preserving canned stuff. I think that's important, right? <laughs> 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 so, um, okay, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close tonight's program and uh, thanks Dan and thanks everyone for joining us. And I should thank our sponsors, Mason Library, Queen State College, 
New Hampshire State Archives and the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. Um, this, uh, this session, this uh, talk with Dan White, Danny White, um, will be uh, available on Facebook in a day or so. And uh, I think we may even be available on the Keene State College's YouTube channel. So, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Great. And um, farewell, good night, and happy National Archives Month.